And a big hello to everybody down there at Dean's Marsh in Penny Royal District. It's Graham Anderson here with a climate update. Just going to look through what's behind the um, wetter years and dry years and what drives climate in your part of the world. So here we've got a great long-term rainfall record for Penny Royal Creek and it goes back to 1882 all the way through all the years to 2017. Um, and what we've got here, this is millimetres of rainfall up the side. Um, the long-term average, this is an anomaly graph, so the long-term average is um, 786 millimetres through there. But you can see some years there's over 1200 mils of rain and some years there's um, less than 600 mils of rain. So a lot of variability and we'll talk about where that some of that variability comes from but also you notice when we look at the last 20 years um, of those 16 have been drier and four wetter so it has been a bit of a drier pattern and we'll talk a little bit about why that might be so but also it's worth looking at um, back in the early 18 uh, 80s there was a run of pretty dry years there in that record as well so natural variability can throw plenty of curveballs at us and uh, we'll talk about up here what's um what's normal and perhaps what isn't Here's that same record for Penny Royal, but the rainfall, it's been split up into the summer, autumn, uh, winter and spring. So you can see lots of variation there um, from year to year. Probably the one thing I will point out <coughs> um, is just that this um, sort of run of autumns, autumns is the one season that's probably being drier more often than it has been in the longer term record. And we'll talk about why that is as well. So the key drivers behind the wetter and dry years down at uh, Dean's Marsh and this part of the world. Well, to make rainfall, basically the key ingredients, you need a good source of moisture. And most of that moisture comes from our warmer um, tropical oceans that um, these sort of areas where that feeds down and feeds into a weather patterns down south. Um, but if all we had was moisture in the air, it would just be humid. So it's where this moisture hits the cold air that you can see all of these cold fronts which whiz around the Southern Ocean and that's called the Southern Annular Mode or SAM. Um, this interaction between moisture hitting this cold air is sort of part of the combination which gives us such reliable rainfall. Um, and some years um, in the Pacific Ocean, we've got the El Nino Southern Oscillation, some years there's a lot of extra moisture flowing in which helps some um, align with those wetter years and some years there's less moisture out here in those El Nino type years and the, the, over here's the Indian Ocean Dipole again like 2016 it was into its wetter pattern which funnels more moisture in and when it hits the cold air down south we um, get a wetter year so we'll talk about um, the influence of those at um, uh, in your district also worth looking at the southern annular mode um, you know those cold fronts flick their tails across southern Australia it's worth noting that um, probably in the last uh, you know 20 or so years they've been shifting a bit further um, southwards and uh, also along here is a thing called the subtropical ridge it's the tram tracks for where the, the high pressure patterns sit so we'll talk about those because they're part of what's interrupting our autumns Here's a sea surface temperature anomaly map. <clears throat> so basically the uh, the ocean along the equator is very warm, like a warm bath, and obviously down here it's quite cold. But this is an anomaly map, so you can see where you can see these sort of um, colours here of the, the red-orange. That's uh, two degrees warmer than a, a bit of ocean normally is. So you can see there's some warm ocean. Now this is going back to what a dry pattern looks like. That's September 2006 was a really dry year down your part of the world, and for a lot of southeast Australia. We had now Nino in the Pacific so lots of warm water here all of the actual extra cloud and everything is formed around where the warm water comes up so the warmest water generates the most moisture and cloud so here you would have had some floods and everything in South America all the cloud would have been out here and when that happens it drags as weather patterns out out um, uh, to the east and so when you see this sort of um, pattern to the north of Australia cooler than average sea surface temperatures there would have been a lot of clear skies in New Guinea there would have been drought there as well but it just means also less moisture to feed into our weather patterns down south so that's what a dry pattern looks like and the oceans an important part of those driver of um, dry years or wetter years keep an eye on this area to the north of Australia when we look at what happens in a wetter pattern So here we go, we've got uh, um, the two, October 2010, this is uh, the La big La Nina and, um, and the Indian Ocean Dipole, both were in their wetter phase that year. So we've got a big La Nina here, but you notice all of this really warm sea surface temperatures to the north of Australia. In fact, it was some record um, temperatures that year. Heaps of cloud, heaps of moisture feeding in to all of our weather patterns. Now, when you have the setup for a season like that, it means that the season's going to be wetter. The, the, um, where the actual rain falls depends on individual weather events. So that's the difference between the, the seasonal forecast and the setup versus actually who's going to get most of the rain but certainly um, that that sort of setup is uh, really wet 
Now when we look at the longer term record, a 30 years are in the dry des tercile, so decile 1 to 3, a third are in the average years and a third are in the wet years, decile 8 to 10. Now what we're going to do is look at the uh, rainfall record at Penny Royal and see if this standard pattern of variability um, happens in the El Nino or Indian Ocean dipole years. So here we go, here's the typical El Nino pattern, there's less moisture coming out of the Pacific, so it's drier in a lot of Eastern Australia, less moisture feed. When we look at the 32 El Ninos and we look at August to November rainfall at uh, Penny Royal in that record, rather than just a third of those um, times being dry, it's actually two thirds of those times being dry. Um, so you can see it doubles the chance of a dry sort of um, uh, late winter spring. You can see there's still um, probably a third of years were okay, either wetter or average, and so that just meant there's moisture coming in from another source. But clearly there's a, a fairly strong El Nino signature in the, the winter spring rainfall there. In La Nina years when there's extra moisture blowing out of the Pacific, um, covers a lot of eastern Australia, and you can see the fingerprints there that um, in the 32 La Nina events that um, that really increases the chance of wetter or average and reduces chance of dry at that Penny Royal site. Here's the Indian Ocean Dipole and you can see when it's in its drier mood, less moisture filters through here and increases the chance of dry, reduces the chance of a wet year. And what's really interesting, like say in 2016, Indian Ocean in its wetter phase, lots of extra moisture. You can see at Penny Royal, whenever the Indian Ocean has been in its wetter phase, it's only ever been wet or average. There's not been a dry year in those um, 21 years that were um, ID negative, and this is for the August November period. So it's a really strong driver for southwest Victoria's climate. So, I guess what I've talked about what's behind good old fashioned variability. Now, I'm just going to um, look at um, is there anything different happening compared to good old fashioned variability? And I guess the main difference is we're squeezing in an extra month of summer. This is the temperature record for Victoria from the <clears throat> from the Bureau that goes back um, to 1910. You can see there for summer, autumn, winter and spring, um, the each decade's been getting stronger since the 50s, getting warmer. I've, what's worth noting though is um, spring's our fastest warming season. So you can see in the last 10 years we've had a number of springs that have been between 1, 2 or even up to 3 degrees warmer than average. So largely we're squeezing in an extra month of summer which means that the it's appearing a bit more often in spring, um, a bit earlier, and hanging around a bit longer into autumns. Um, so what we've got to deal with rainfall variability, the important thing with climate change is that what's creeping up on us is this um, uh, increasing temperature trends. And another really important thing that's, a, that's uh, not quite normal at the moment is the pressure pattern over southern Australia. If you have a look at um, this sort of region, since the 50s, this is a grash of pressure for this southern region of Australia. It goes up and down and variable as you'd expect from year to year, but there's been a clear trend there. And certainly since the, um, the mid-90s, um, you know, we've, we've certainly uh, seen that. And then there was a record sort of set in the El Nino of 2015. So El Ninos tend to give higher pressures over our part of the world, and La Nina is sort of lower but um, what's sort of happening is as temperatures have been getting stronger the process behind this subtropical ridge which sets the pressure pattern has just been getting stronger so pressure patterns getting stronger and that's partly um, to blame for why um, autumns have been um, probably drier in the last 20 years so that's a trend that they were expecting um, with climate change and it's actually what's been observed and they expect that to continue in future um, I guess the impact of um, while you might have um, you know some reductions in rainfall, it has an even uh, an amplified uh, reduction in runoff. So this is a reference catchment from <clears throat> down in the Otway. So reference catchment is just one where there's no human sort of um, interventions or uh, upstream. So you can see here since the mid 90s, since that bit of a reduction in rainfall, there's been a bit of a step change there in in, the step, in that um, flow. And so there's still you know wet years. It's just that the average flow there's less water to go around. So that's part of the challenge of why improved water planning and water security is going to be really important. If you um, have this sort of thing happening in a catchment where there's a lot of people upstream then you will get an amplified response in terms of um, you know downstream impact so water is only going to become more important. Um, another interesting bit of work done by Dave Stevens, um, um, which was looking at um, seasonality of rainfall when it falls throughout the year, and we've got sort of summer rainfall dominant zones and strong winter dominant rainfall zones and zones where it's uniform throughout the year. Um, he just looked at where when rain has fallen. Uh, 
since 2000 um, and compare that to, to when rain had fallen for the previous hundred years and what basically it noted is that all of these rainfall um, the seasonality of these zones had shifted south so basically the the uniform areas are shifting south um, all of them are shifting south so part of the challenge for what Victoria which is a strongly winter dominant um, over time they expect to see more of that where there'll be more variability throughout the season which will create some challenges for us about how we how we manage that um, transition I guess so that's what's been expected to happen with climate change and it's what we've um, seen already okay, the important point is that there's um, successful agriculture happening in all of these climate zones so climate zones alone doesn't determine how successful you'll be in agriculture the key challenge is around how you shift um, from your current climate to the new one and there's a lot of fantastic stuff happening on farms um, to deal with these sort of changes. Um, modern tech, R&D, genetics, innovations that are all being applied that um, you know are really uh, um, important for farm uh, improvements. Improve infrastructure on farms for storage of water and fodder really important. So that's what you're talking about today. Is water is going to be? It's already important, but it's only going to get more important. Um, we're living in a time where there's certainly great growth in local and export markets, and the importance of biosecurity is really important to maintain that. Business management for handling variable years and income is a really important part of modern day farming. Also has been fantastic work done with land care and farm planning and, and better management of pastures and soils. Really critical part to dealing with increasing variability is looking after our soil and farm assets. And the key thing and what you're doing today is making sure you surround yourself with good networks and knowledge challenge so you've got the confidence to, to grow your business and look after your properties and um, you know enjoy what you're doing. So um, I hope that's been useful. If you're interested in getting monthly updates on what the Indian Ocean Dipole or the uh, Pacific Ocean's up to and seasonal forecasting, um, just drop an email to that.break at ecodev.vic.gov.au. We can um, that's free to subscribe to, and we send um, we provide monthly commentary on that. So all the best. Also, we've got um, new animations on the climate dogs. Just Google them, uh, which really gives explains pretty quickly the science behind each of those big climate drivers. So all the best.